الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وجاءت رسل ربنا بالحق وصدق المرسلون وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له قل اللهم مالك الملك تؤتي الملك من تشاء وتنزع الملك ممن تشاء وتعز من تشاء وتذل من تشاء بيدك الخير إنك على كل شيء قدير وأشهد أن سيدنا وأولنا وسابقنا وهادينا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله أرسل على فترة من الرسل وقلة من العلم وضلالة في الناس من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا مضل له ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا هادي له اللهم اجعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه أما بعد أيها المؤمنون أيها المؤمنات committed brothers and committed sisters Islamic solidarity Islamic togetherness and Islamic unity is what runs through the ayat of the Qur'an and the Prophet's hadiths and teachings. Anytime there is an inclination or a tendency to break away from this unity, it is condemned by Allah and condemned by his prophet in no uncertain terms. Many ayat in the Quran speak about the divisions that are be, that are to be avoided. ولا تكون كالذين تفرقوا وَمَا تَفَرَّقَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ And then on the positive, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying to us, not to be divided, not to be separated we can have different points of views that's legitimate what is not legitimate is for us to harbor bad feelings towards each other that is not legitimate that is not Islamic if we disagree with each other we can reach some type of understanding concerning the disagreement. There's no need for hostilities and no need for friction among us.
I'm not saying this in a vacuum. I'm saying this because mo most of the suffering that we are subject to, we meaning the two billion Muslims in the world, most of that suffering can be attributed to our divisions and divisiveness. The talk of the town, the talk of the globe, is about the, what is called the deal of the century. The deal of the century is turning out to be a political ruse, a political trick that wants to secure the political future of the occupant of the White House and his counterpart, the war criminal in colonized Palestine. That's all it's about. It has nothing to do with humanity. It has nothing to do with uh, the prosperity of certain populations and the future of the Muslim East or any of these other things that you may be hearing and tuning into. It has nothing to do with that. There is an indictable prime minister in colonized Palestine and there's an impeachable president in the United States. They want to get out of that hole, so they went through through the, offici the official movements and motions that we were that we saw in the past few days. I want to remind you that the progress to some people it might not seem like progress. But the progress of the Palestinian issue is due to an Islamic change that solidly took place in Iran and an Islamic change that is incrementally taking place in other geographical areas around colonized Palestine. These types of movements forward throughout these past decades were made possible by Muslims avoiding as much as possible wars among themselves. There is a war that could not be avoided, and that was the Im initially the imposed war on the Islamic base in Iran. And then in the past eight or nine years, the imposed internal strife on the Muslims in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in North Africa, and in the Arabian Peninsula. This is how we should understand today's political maneuvers in light of this context. And much of this forward movement, much of it is attributed to the leadership in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Truth be said, if it wasn't for that leadership, we would not have what is happening today. And that leadership has been subjected to military assaults from different quarters of the world and then also internal threats from within its own context. And it survived, and it continues to survive, walillahi alhamd. All praise is due to Allah. 
But there is something I have to clear my conscience on. And that something is like an, a slow-moving internal erosion that is taking place within those who consider themselves supporters of the Islamic leadership in Iran. These voices now are not really heard that much. They were not heard at all 35 years ago. You wouldn't hear them. They were whispers inside different individuals. It was at a whispering level. But since that time and in the years that followed, in the past 30 years, these voices have become louder and louder and louder. And what they want to do is undermine the legitimacy of an Islamic leadership. This is nothing new. It happened 14 centuries ago. King Muawiyah and the people with him, they wanted to undermine the, the legitimate Islamic leadership. Nothing new. At least we should have enough hindsight to say, wait a minute, we're not going to go through this again. It was done once before, but we're not going to let it happen again. Now let me, I never thought I'd reach the point, we would reach the point where we're going to have to expose those who consider themselves supporters of the Islamic leadership, but at the same time, they are working night and day to chip away at that Islamic leadership. I know probably most of you, because you're not ulama, but most of you have not heard the word Batriyin or Batriyun. In the school of thought that the Islamic leadership in, below, in Iran belongs to, in the literatures, the Islamic literature, you will find, if you were deeply engrossed in history and in fiqh, you will find a, this word, al-batriyin or al-batriyun, and what the word means is those who take away from the legitimacy of the leadership of Ahl al-Bayt and the Imams by either sympathizing with or endorsing other leaderships. That's the general meaning of the word. These types, these types of people have been around. They're smart. Give them credit where credit is due. They're smart. But they're smart in the wrong direction. This is what some of them have been saying. We have, these have to be exposed before it's too late. I don't want someone to come 10 years from now, may Allah forbid, and we no longer have an Islamic leadership, or we have a very frail and ceremonious leadership without any force or without any strategy to it. I don't want to reach that point and say, why, why didn't you speak about this earlier? No, we're going to speak about it now. One of the Islamic scholars who comes from that school of thought, when he mentioned Abu Bakr and Umar, he said, may Allah have mercy on them. 
This is an... I hesitate to mention his name. It's enough, it's enough to know that this is an Islamic, Islamic scholar who passed away several years ago in Lebanon. Maybe that will tell you who he is. When he mentioned the word Abu Bakr and Umar, he said, Yarhamuhum Allah. May Allah's mercy be upon them. And then these types, the ones that have been calculating, they point their fingers at him, he says, almost saying he's a traitor. They used quite a few words to describe him, and you can distill those words in the word, he's a traitor to our faith or to our madhab, or to our deen, depending on who you're, you're listening to. That's one. Another one, another scholar, an Iraqi scholar, who has this very independent approach in bridging the passageways between Mus between Shi'is and Sunnis. He is described as Dhalun Mudil. He's a person who is misled and is misleading. These are these are Wahdawi Muslims. These are Muslims who want to bring Muslims together. And this is how this lobby... I also hesitate to use one word because it will be misinterpreted and some may think that it is too harsh. But this lobby inside the Shi'i school of thought... This is the way it approaches Muslims who want to build bridges with other Muslims. There's another Iraqi, this, this particular scholar is still alive. Another unifying Muslim scholar who passed away also from Iraq, passed away several years ago, very well known. This is what they say about him. One of them says about him. Let this scholar who passed away, I don't want to mention his name. I will, any of you interested in knowing their names, I'll give you their names if you ask me. He said, he, let him save himself from the fire on the day of judgment. A Muslim? who extends his hands. No one is negotiating away their beliefs. You can be as strong a believer in your tashayyur as you like. But don't have that strength turn into hostility and host hostile words pertaining to other Muslims. And then you have and this is what made me express myself in this khutbah on this day. Then you have one of these types who are against Islamic togetherness. They said about the leader, the imam of the Muslims in our day, whether some Muslims know it or not, that's another issue. It's a fact of the matter. That he said, this person is a person who is wearing a Wahhabi amama, a Wahhabi turban dress, headdress, who presents himself or projects himself in the image of a Shi'i. How far? How far are we going to go? 
in having these types, all of these, 40 years ago, these types of ideas, if we can call them ideas, and these types of feelings were there. We have to ask ourselves why at that time they were not, they did not go public with these types of words and now they are going public. Let me let me address this this type of mentality. I I wish there would be a a, a person who comes from a Shi'i background. Your speaker is almost like an unknown, meaning that we can't tell what he we don't know what he is. On some issues, he appears to be like a Shi'i. On other issues, he appears to be like a Sunni. He confuses us. I wish that a person would say what I am saying who will not confuse the listeners and those who are tuned in. Meaning someone who comes from a Shi'i context. In the reliable books of history that you refer to, is it not a fact of this common history that an Imam Ali advised, he gave nasiha to Abi Bakr and Umar. Isn't this a fact? Did he ever express, did he ever use foul words when he spoke about, referred to, or interacted with Abi Bakr and Umar? Can anyone give us any detail in history that says that was the case? Much less, can anyone cite for us a lana by the Imam or any of the Imams of these successors to the Prophet? You may say, and you have the right, everyone has the right to hold the opinion and the evaluation that they feel comfortable with in the depths of their hearts and minds. But not to set, to withhold foul language does not mean you automatically endorse these two successors to Allah's Prophet. We don't want to go to the extent of, you know, digging up inf- other information that shows how there was respect, there was dignity, and there was an understanding between Imam Ali on one side and the Khulafa on the other side. When Uthman, the third successor to Allah's Prophet, when the issues became more critical, more polarizing. In your books, history books, fiqh books, seerah books, whatever books you may refer to, go to them all. Isn't it agreed upon that when the protesters came from al-Basra and from Egypt and from Yemen and from other parts of those surrounding areas. When they came to, in today's language, demonstrate against Uthman, wasn't it al-Imam Ali who sent al-Hasan and al-Husayn both, his two sons, Sayyidai Ahlil al-Jannah? Didn't he send them to let, in today's language, to be his bodyguards? This is, this is the successor to the Prophet who in some of these books that come from the types of divisive Muslims who say he's going to have horns protrude, Uthman is going to have horns protruding from his head on the day of judgment and he's going to be in hell. This is, where do you get this attitude from? 
Where does this come from? Can you evaluate yourself? There's also information that Al Hassan and Al Hussein, Al Imam Al Hassan and Al Imam Al Hussein expressed gracious words towards the Khulafa. And they knew what was going on. There was no, this is not a puzzle. They were living their time. Imam Ali in Nahj al Balagha, when he speaks about Umar, Mother Naqi al Thawb. Where did all of this go? Are they hiding this? They, do they know this or don't they know this? Al Imam Zaid, in his time of need, when he was threatened by the illegitimate Umawi rulers, he had a delegation of Basrawis, people from Basra go to him. They asked him, we hear that you do not condemn the Khulafa. Is that right? Is it right what we hear? We're coming to support you. Do you condemn them or do you not condemn them? He said, no, I don't condemn them. Why do we have today the language that is still right now beneath the surface? Why do we have today some Muslims who consider other Muslims lesser Muslims if they cannot condemn the Khulafa? So they said to him, if that's the case, we don't we don't want to support you. The Basrawis. The Imam Zayn al Abidin alayhi salam. Quote, this is what he said. Laysa min akhlaqina al it, is not, it doesn't belong to our mannerism or to our morality. This attitude of la'an. Yeah, there's la'an. La'an is a Qur'anic word. There are people in this world, but it doesn't become a permanent feature. And it, when it comes to Muslims, it, it is not a divisive feature. There is also another delegation from these Basrawis, these Muslims from Basra. They also approached an Imam Zain al Abidin. And they were using bad words, foul language, the nastiest choice of words against the Khulafa. He listened. He said, Are you from the Ansar? He said, No. Are you from the Muhajiri? He said, no. Are you from al ladina tabawa uddar? All of these are Quranic descriptions of Muslims. Are you from them? They said, no. He said to them, Qumu. Take leave. Qumu anni la barakallahu bikum. Take leave. May Allah withhold His grace from you. أَحِبُّونِي حُبَّ الْإِسْلَامِ If you love me, you love me the love of Islam. Imam al-Sadiq ala al-a'immati al-salam He said about those who use curse words concerning the Khulafa. He said, Abu Bakr in Jeddi Maratain. Abu Bakr is my grandfather twice. Is this common knowledge? Why isn't this common knowledge? 
Why are the, why do we have some people deliberately omitting this information from the public mind? لَقَدْ وَلَدَنِي أَبُوْ بَكْرٍ مَرَّتَيْنِ And then there's another quote from Al-Imam Al-Ridha, which unfortunately I don't have enough time to go through because I, I will I will just sum it up in what Al Imam Al Ridha said to one of the followers by the name of Abu Mahmud. He said to him, "Our enemies present us in three configurations." I'm paraphrasing. Our enemies present us in three configurations. One configuration is they exaggerate about us. They go overboard in speaking about us. Another configuration they present us in is that somehow we have a character deficiency. To be a little clear on this, those who exaggerate us is what is called Ali Ilahis. The Imams are either deities or demi deities, quasi deities. Those, and that's true, that's part of history. Imam, the Imam is speaking the truth. And then those who say there's a, there's a character, character deficiency in us said that Imam Al Hassan was a Mizwaj Mutlaq, meaning. He got married often and he divorced often. And then those who, who present us as almost like natural enemies. Somehow we are enemies. When we never generated any animosity, they generate that animosity and they say we are the ones who are. And this is what we have in the real world today. Nothing went, nothing left. And we should learn from Allah's words. An ayah says, وَلَا تَسُبُّوا الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّوا اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ Allah is telling us, let's put this aside the historical issue here. Allah is telling us, don't use foul language, don't use curse words. When you refer to false gods, وَلَا تَسُبُّوا الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ The mushriks and the kafirs, the deities and the authorities that they have, don't use foul language against them. Because the result is, فَيَسُبُّوا اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ They are going to use foul words against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not knowing what they are saying or doing. The reason I say this, the reason I covered this territory here is because, as I said at the beginning of the khutbah, this is nothing new. What we are living with today is nothing really new. What is going on is a battle for public opinion. And right now, there are those who want the leadership in the Islamic base in Iran, they want that leadership to acquiesce to public opinion. Say, look, this is a majority. The majority of people they want, and then they go on and on and on. What they want is the Islamic leadership not stay the course. That's what they want. This is what happened in the time of an Imam Ali. When the battle was being won, they wanted to turn public opinion against an Imam Ali. Look, the enemy wants to reconcile. They are showing us the Quran. They want to arbitrate according to the Qur'an. 
Al-Imam's opinion was this is a trick. Don't fall for it. But when public opinion was, most of the Muslims, that's what they wanted. His own camp, that's what they wanted. What do you do? They want to repeat this. And we hope and we pray that there's enough public opinion that will defeat the internal forces and the external forces that want the leadership to acquiesce to a false impression that there is something good in the gestures of goodwill that come their way. Al-Mu'minu, the Prophet of Allah, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, says, لا يلده المؤمن من جحر مرتين A committed Muslim is not stung from the same source twice. In our history, the Byzantines, those who were instigating the Umawis against the legitimate leadership of the Muslims, they were hiding. The Umawis were up front. Behind the scenes, they were supported by the Byzantines. In today's world, the United States cannot hide. The Israelis cannot hide. They can't hide. And their Muawiyah and their Umawis of today are not, cannot fool Muslim public opinion like Muslim public opinion was fooled 14 centuries ago. I never knew, I never thought it would come to this, to a Jumu'ah khutbah having by necessity to having to expose those who are working hand in hand. How did this, how did this assassination take place? four weeks or so ago. How did it happen if it weren't for the inside working with the outside to try to confine the Islamic leadership? It's the only explanation we have for that. And if we are not aware, if we are not vigilant, if we are not living in real time, with real events, with real understanding of Allah and his prophet, then we will not have an excuse or an alibi on the day of responsibility, accountability, and judgment. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ودعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله إن الله تواب رحيم (coughs) الحمد لله بجميع المحامد على جميع النعم صلى الله وسلم على المبعوث خيرا ورحمة وهدى لكافة الأمم محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Dear committed Muslims, brothers and sisters, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the neo-Umawis of today do not have the cover that the original Umawis of 14 centuries ago had. They stand to be exposed, especially in the, in the past few days when this so-called deal of the century occupied the mainstream media almost everywhere. What what do we have in further exposing these Saudi turncoats? What do we have? We have in the past week News from multiple sources saying that it 
has the Israeli political, military, and war criminals giving permission to their citizens to go to Saudi Arabia. Muslims, dear Muslims, be aware of the treatment in which that regime in the Arabian Peninsula is treating those who stole the Holy Land compared to Muslims who want to go to Mecca and the Medina. It is said in these news sources that visas will be given for Israelis to go to Arabia for nine days. Whatever the purpose may be, financial, commercial, tourist, whatever. All of a sudden, the Saudi officials, they sensed this is not, this won't help them. So they denied the news item. Of course, their denial is for survival purposes. They stand exposed. There was a correspondent from Channel 12 in the Israeli broadcasting system, TV Channel 12. He did a report, and that report is on the internet, in social media, all over the place. You're lying, meaning the Saudi officials are lying to us, to the world, when they say, no, the Israelis are not permitted to come to Jeddah or Riyadh or the first step you go to Jeddah and Riyadh that's where they've been going the next step if it continues like this the next step is they will go to Khaybar remember they used to be in Khaybar what do you want them to say when they reach Khaybar to stand to the world and say we are back They could even go further. They could say, Oh Muhammad, you defeated us 14 centuries ago, and now we have defeated you. And with the money and the influence and all this that they have, they can go further and claim, There was Bani Khaynuqa, Bani Nadir, Bani Quraidha in Al Medina. We want to reclaim our part of Al Medina. Alhamdulillah, in the past 24 hours, there were other missiles launched from Yemen to legitimate targets inside the kingdom of the Saudi ruling family. This MBS personality, he has his mercenaries and his spies keeping an eye on those who carry the citizenship of that kingdom I want, don't want to use Saudi citizens those who carry the citizenship of that kingdom trailing them spying on them one such citizen in what is called the United Kingdom, may it become the divided kingdom, which by the way today is leaving Brexit, I mean is leaving the European Union. Today is the official day when it is pulling out of the European Union. This person from that kingdom is trying, he's trying to use legal channels to get back at the crown prince. A Saudi woman who was in the news months ago 
appeared once again in the news this past week. I think she's living in Canada now. She appeared in a picture with a cross on her chest with the typical image of a non-dressing woman. And she says that she's proud now that she is free. She's no longer the slave of men. That's the impression they are getting in that ki- women in that kingdom. I'm not saying this is all over, but at least some women, that's the way they feel. And this is how they react. Officially, on the record, that ruling family said that it does not support the U.S. withdrawing from Iraq because it doesn't serve future security purposes in that region. Then we had a Saudi blogger in Riyadh, and this is also going viral. A Saudi blogger in Riyadh wearing his dashdasha, his thawb, his robe, receiving a Hasidic Yehudi. And the Hasidic Yehudi gave him a present. And that present says, it's a statement among the Yehudis, May Allah, may, may my right hand not belong to me if I forfeit you, O Jerusalem, or something like that. And they're singing both together, Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. Which in Hebrew, it, it means Assalamu Alaikum. They're singing together to the camera. And I, this is another one of these imageries that is seeded into our conscious and subconscious to begin to accept the theft of the two holy lands. The holy land of Al-Quds and the holy land of Mecca and al Medina. In the past weeks, the U.S. has increased its military presence in the Arabian Peninsula, in particular in a sultan Al Amir Sultan Air Base. It sent more manpower there and it sent more warplanes there. In today's khutbah, you know, the, the official Saudi religious person who's responsible for the haram in Mecca and Al Medina, as Sudais, in previous khutbahs, he, he used to give lip service to the Palestinians. He used to mention Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Not in today's khutbah. In the political atmosphere of the past few days and what is called the deal of the century or the steal of the century, more accurate, he didn't mention Al-Quds, he didn't mention Palestine or the Palestinians. The only the general statement that can, with squeezing your mind, be attributed to all of what is happening is, Allahu marfa hadhi al ghumma an hadhi al umma. O Allah, relieve this umma from this gloom that it is in. And then the Sunday Times. Britain, the Sunday Times, not some Islamic radical speaking, Sunday Times says, the Israelis are working on an ethnic weapon that identifies distinctive genes carried by Arabs to create a genetically modified bacterium or virus using viruses and bacteria to alter the DNA inside living cells and attack only those cells being Arabic genes. 
Don't say, you know, we are uh, rabble-rousers on the street. This is what you're saying. We're not supposed to read this. We're not supposed to understand this. We're not supposed to put this in context. And then massive force of, this is the first Jumu'ah after this deal of the century as they call it. Massive troop presence of Zionist Israeli troops at Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. No one less than President, ex-President Carter who said that what Trump is doing he cautioned from the practical consequences of the implementation of Trump's plan and he further said it is a violation of international law President Carter not some Muslim revolutionary somewhere. If a Muslim was to say something like this, everyone's going to point their finger at them. The Shaykh of Al Masjid Al Aqsa, his name is Ikrima Sabri. He was forced by the Israeli military and to leave the masjid and banned for four months from entering the masjid. What is happening in Masjid Al-Aqsa is what happened here 37 years ago or so. Then we have some decent Jews, conscientious Jews, who expressed their conscience and their mind opposing Netanyahu who does not represent the Jews or does not represent Jewry. Demonstrating with dignity at the same as all of this is taking place more Patriot missiles are sent into Iraq for the first time we hear the titular head of the Palestine Authority Mr. Mahmoud Abbas can you believe this? He refused to take a call from President Trump. This is how critical the issue has become. They used to play on the divisiveness of Fatah and Hamas. Now Fatah and Hamas, has they closed ranks. Something that was unimaginable a year or two ago. The demonstrations breaking out, we hope and we solemnly hold to be the forthcoming breakthrough with the movement of peoples against their regimes in that area and for that matter in other areas of the world and we hope the case will be the same here in the United States when they can have enough relationship with God that they can expose those who are taking the country in the wrong direction. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan warzuqna tiba'a wa arina al-batila batilan warzuqna ijtinaba ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا وسعت كل شيء رحمة وعلما فاغفر للذين تابوا واتبعوا سبيلك وقهم عذاب الجحيم ربنا وأدخلهم جنات عدن التي وعدتهم ومن صلح من آبائهم وأزواجهم وذرياتهم إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم 
ربنا لا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا أفرغ علينا الصبر وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا أفرغ علينا الصبر وتوفنا مسلمين ربنا صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول